The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are the way, heaven, earth, the commander, method and discipline. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison in this way. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? Which of the two generals has the most ability? With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? Which army is stronger? On which side are officers and men more highly trained? In which army is there the greater constancy, both in reward and punishment? By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. If your opponent is of a choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy. Neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. Poverty of the state exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintaining an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. Now, in order to kill an enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. Thus, it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So too, it is better to recapture an army entire than to destroy it, to capture a regiment or detachment or a company entire than to destroy them. Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus, the highest form of generalship is to bulk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. It is the role in war, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one, to surround him. If five to one, to attack him. If twice as numerous, to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end, it must be captured by the larger force. The 
Thus we may know that there are five essentials for victory. He will win who knows when to fight, and when not to fight. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. He will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the Sovereign. The skillful fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible and does not miss the moment for defeating the enemy. Thus it is that in war the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. The consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to method and discipline. Thus it is in his power to control success. In respect of military method we have, firstly, measurement, secondly, estimation of quantity, thirdly, calculation, fourthly, balancing of chances, fifthly, victory. Measurement owes its existence to earth, estimation of quantity to measurement, calculation to estimation of quantity, balancing of chances to calculation, and victory to balancing of chances. A victorious army, as opposed to a routed one, is as a pound's weight placed in the scale against a single grain. The onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of a pent-up waters into a chasm of a thousand fathoms deep. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams, like the sun and the moon, they end but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away to return once more. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combination of these five give rise to more melodies than can ever be heard. There are not more than five primary colours, blue, yellow, red, white and black, yet in combination they produce more hues that can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter, yet combinations of them yield more flavours than can be ever tasted. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect, yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of manoeuvres. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon, which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. Therefore the good fighter will be terrible in his onset, and prompt in his decision. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision to the releasing of the trigger. Simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. Simulated weakness postulates strength. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is simply a question of subdivision. Concealing courage under a show of timidity presupposes a fund of latent energy. Masking strength with weakness is to be affected by tactical dispositions. Thus, one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances, according to which the enemy will act. He sacrifices something that the enemy may snatch at it. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy and does not require too much from individuals. 
Hence, his ability to pick out the right men and utilise combined energy. When he utilises combined energy, his fighting men become, as it were, like unto rolling logs or stones. For it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground, and to move when on a slope, if four-cornered to come to a standstill, but if round-shaped to go rolling down. Thus the energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone rolling down a mountain thousands of feet in height. So much on the subject of energy. Whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle will arrive exhausted. Therefore the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. He can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord, or by inflicting damage he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defence if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. Hence, that general is skilful in attack whose opponent does not know what to defend, and he is skilful in defence whose opponent does not know what to attack. O oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy! Through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible, and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points, and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonise the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. After that comes tactical manoeuvring, than which there is nothing more difficult. The difficulty of tactical manoeuvring consists in turning the devious into the direct, and misfortune into gain. Thus, to take a long and circuitous route after enticing the enemy out of the way, and though starting after him to contrive to reach the goal before him, shows knowledge of the artifice of deviation. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous, with an undisciplined multitude most dangerous. Let your rapidity be that of the wind, your compactness that of the forest. In raiding and plundering be like fire, in immovability like a mountain. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. Do not swallow bait offered by the enemy. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. Such is the art of warfare. When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed-in situations, you must resort to strategy. In desperate positions, you must fight. There are roads which must not be followed, armies which must not be attacked, towns which must be besieged, positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics knows how to handle his troops. 
The general who does not understand these may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country, yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Cowardice, which leads to capture. A hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. A delicacy of honour, which is sensitive to shame. Over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. After crossing a river, you should get far away from it. When an invading force crosses a river in its onward march, do not advance to meet it in midstream. It will be best to let half the army get across and then deliver your attack. If you are anxious to fight, you should not go to meet the invader near a river which he has to cross. When you come to a hill or a bank, occupy the sunny side with the slope on your right rear. Thus, you will at once act for the benefits of your soldiers and utilize the natural advantages of the ground. When, in consequence of heavy rains up country, a river which you wish to ford is swollen and flecked with foam, you must wait until it subsides. Country in which there are precipitous cliffs with torrents running between, deep natural hollows, confined places, tangled thickets, quagmires and crevasses, should be left with all possible speed and not approached. If his place of encampment is easy of access, he is tendering a bait. Movement amongst the trees or forest shows that the enemy is advancing. The appearance of a number of screens in the midst of a thick grass means that the enemy wants to make us suspicious. The rising of birds in their flight is the sign of an ambush. Startled beasts indicate that a sudden attack is coming. Sun Tzu says, we may distinguish six kinds of terrain. Accessible ground, entangling ground, temporizing ground, narrow passes, precipitous heights, positions at a great distance from the enemy. Ground which can be freely traversed by both sides is called accessible. With regard to ground of this nature, be before the enemy and occupying the raised and sunny spots, and carefully guard your line of supplies. Then you will be able to fight with advantage. Ground which can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy is called entangling. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. Look upon them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. If, however, you are indulgent, but unable to make your authority felt, kind-hearted, but unable to enforce your commands, and incapable, moreover, of quelling disorder, then your soldiers must be likened to spoilt children. They are useless for any practical purpose. Those who were called skillful leaders of old knew how to drive a wedge between the enemy's front and rear to prevent cooperation between his large and small divisions, to hinder the good troops from rescuing the bad, the officers from rallying their men. Throw your soldiers into positions whence there is no escape, and they will prefer death to flight. If they will face death, there is nothing they may not achieve. Officers and men alike will put forth their uttermost strength. Soldiers, when in desperate straits, lose the sense of fear. If there is no place of refuge, they will stand firm. If they are in hostile country, they will show a stubborn front. 
If there is no help for it, they will fight hard. The skillful tactician may be likened to the Shuai Jan. Now, the Shuai Jan is a snake that is found in the Chang Mountains. Strike at its head and you will be attacked by its tail. Strike at its tail and you will be attacked by its head. Strike at its middle and you will be attacked by head and tail, both. Sun Tzu said, there are five ways of attacking with fire. The first is to burn soldiers in their camp. The second is to burn stores. The third is to burn baggage trains. The fourth is to burn arsenals and magazines. The fifth is to hurl dropping fire amongst the enemy. In order to carry out an attack, we must have means available. The material for raising fire should always be kept in readiness. There is a proper season for making attacks with fire and special days for starting a conflagration. The proper season is when the weather is very dry. The special days are those when the moon is in the constellations of the sieve, the wall, the wing or the crossbar. For these four days are all days of rising wind. In attacking with fire, one should be prepared to meet five possible developments. When fire breaks out inside an enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from without. If there is an outbreak of fire, but the enemy's soldiers remain quiet, bide your time and do not attack. When the force of the flames has reached its height, follow it up with an attack, if that is practicable. If not, stay where you are. If it is possible to make an assault with fire from without, do not wait for it to break out within, but deliver your attack at a favourable moment. When you start a fire, be windward of it. Do not attack from the leeward. Raising a host of a hundred thousand men and marching them great distances entails heavy losses on the people and a drain on the resources of the state. The daily expenditure will amount to a thousand ounces of silver. There will be commotion at home and abroad and men will drop down exhausted on the highways. As many as seven hundred thousand families will be impeded in their labour. Hostile armies may face each other for years, striving for the victory which is decided in a single day. This being so, to remain in ignorance of the enemy's condition simply because one grudges the outlay of a hundred ounces of silver is the height of inhumanity. One who acts thus is no leader of men, no present help to his sovereign, no master of victory. Thus, what enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men is foreknowledge. Now, this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be attained inductively from experience nor by any deductive calculation. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained from other men. Hence the use of spies, of whom there are five classes. Local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, and surviving spies. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. Having inward spies making use of officials of the enemy. Having converted spies getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for our own purposes. Having doomed spies doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. Surviving spies finally are those who bring back news from the enemy camp. Hence it is that which none in the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies. 
none should be more liberally rewarded. In no other business should greater secrecy be preserved. Spies cannot be usefully employed without a certain intuitive sagacity. Hence, it is only the enlightened ruler and the wise general who will use the highest intelligence of the army for purposes of spying, and thereby they achieve great results. I hope you've enjoyed the selection of extracts from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. If you'd like to study these teachings in more depth, I'd like to recommend The Ultimate Art of War, a step-by-step -step illustrated guide to Sun Tzu's teachings by Antony Cummins.